support for this podcast comes from Dynamic. Dynamic Air Quality Solutions supplies the private label air defense system IAQ products exclusively to SGI members. Based on science and logic, these high-performing IAQ products control all three phases of indoor air contamination and are supported by world-class technical and communication training for your entire team. Learn how to build an IAQ culture with your company with highly profitable IAQ products while helping your clients breathe cleaner, healthier, and fresher indoor air. To partner with us, email Michelle Hogan today at worldclass at dynamicaqs.com. Welcome to The Successful Contractor, powered by Success Group International, a show for residential contractors about residential contractors. We chronicle business journeys, share insights, and celebrate successes in this wonderful industry. I'm your host, Bob Houchin. Hello there, SGI family and other contractor friends. I'm so thankful you're here. Uh, as a reminder, all episodes of The Successful Contractor Show are available on YouTube as well as your podcast player of choice. Also, if you're a non-member interested in learning more about SGI, how we can help your business grow both top and bottom line, while also becoming part of the contracting industry's largest network of contractors, we are having Profit Day seminars all over the place. New Orleans, Tampa, Las Vegas, and Portland, Maine uh, come to mind right away. So give us a call at 866 866- 299-8505 to attend. SGI members in those markets, if you'd like to come and share with everyone your experiences, your story with that group, give your coach a call. We'd greatly appreciate you and your help. Today's show is a great discussion I had with Trent Urban of Wirenut Home Services in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Trent is a phenomenal person. I've had the great fortune of knowing Trent for probably the last 15 years or so. Uh, when you talk to him, especially in person, he's a lot of fun. But he's also a fountain of knowledge, and he enjoys sharing that knowledge with others. Uh, Trent epitomizes what's great about SGI. He values and enjoys giving and helping. Uh, And Trent gives us a lot today. Uh, First of all, let's talk about Wirenut Home Services. Uh, The company enjoyed 60% growth last year, putting them at $14 million. Uh, And in this year, 2022, he expects another 60% growth year, of course, with a phenomenal uh, net profit, because that's what really matters. Uh, so it, they're going to be past $20 million in 2022. And Trent will explain how he and his amazing team have accomplished these results. In particular, we talk about how culture played a big part of it. Uh, Wirenut is a relational business, not a transactional business. And that's been the foundation uh, that they've needed to drive these this type of growth. Uh, we also talk a lot about people. Uh, tr- Trent talks about... Uh, a wire nut school that they're in the initial phases of, of building. Uh, we talk about what his recruiter does and, and how uh, that person is responsible for filling a lot of these open positions as the company's growing. Uh, Trent also talks about finding and growing leaders in his business because you can't always just hire techs and salespeople and CCRs and dispatchers. You need someone to lead those individuals. Um, we also talk about how Trent manages the business. Uh, in particular, we, we dig into how an EOS helped him fall back in love in being a, a business owner. Um, he contemplated selling wire at one point. It was just a lot of hecticness going on, but he got an EOS in place, and that made a big difference. And now he uh, loves driving the business, and obviously the results, uh, that they are what they are. You can see that, that they're effectively driving it very well. Uh, and we talk about a whole lot more. In fact, the interview uh, is 90 minutes, so I apologize, but I think you're going to find a lot of value in it. We actually talk for over two hours because I enjoyed talking to Trent so much. And uh, I'll tell you, if you are coming to Expo in Orlando, please seek out Trent, introduce yourself. Um, I urge you to to talk to him. It'll be the best thing you do. He's just a a great guy and a great part of SGI. So without further ado, here's Trent Urban of Wirenut Home Services in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I hope you enjoy it and take away a nugget or two. Hey, Trent, it's great to see you. So excited to have you on the show. For those who haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, can you please share uh, your name, your company name, and where you are located? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I'm Trent Urban, uh, owner of Wirenut Home Services, so owner and president. President's my working side of it, and we're based in Colorado Springs. Excellent. Very good. Very good. Now we're talking for a couple of reasons. One, I know you've had a, a phenomenal year, and two, you're a great mentor and, and friend of many in the industry. You're always willing to help. I've always appreciated that about you. But but you did have a really good 2021. 20, uh, so kind of share with any, everyone, where did you finish last year uh, in terms of revenue? Uh, we did uh, just over $14 million. 
just over 14. Now, what did that break down in the three trades that you, you do? Um, I couldn't put an exact number to it, but we're about a uh, mid 60% on HVAC side. Okay. And, and electrical fills in the majority of the rest of that gap. And then we have plumbing that's taken off. It's, we did, what was it? Just over a million or something of plumbing. Oh, wow. That's pretty good. Cause you plumbing, you just started like, mm-hmm. like 2020, I think is when you first were playing with starting it. And then obviously everything kind of got wonky and. Is yeah, that what, it took that right? a while to find the team and do all that. Yeah, right. I figured it was going to be about as tricky as finding electricians, and it proved to be. So yeah, pretty yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think we did 1.3 in plumbing, I believe, last year. Okay, that's cool. So when you uh, when you're planning for growth in in 22, what uh, what kind of goals do you have to hit the end of this year? Uh, we're projected for 60 percent growth. Wow, really? So yeah, and that's that's, aggressive. Ba- that's not based on hey, we just want to do it. It's based on what we've been doing and and the things that we have in place and all that. For example, we've got drains that we're adding. You could consider it to be plumbing, but we're not considering it to be plumbing. It's a whole that's, other animal. So. That's one of my questions, was asking if you were doing drain cleaning yet or not. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, yeah, yeah, we've already happen. had a few jobs sold, and I've just dropped a small fortune in equipment over the last oh, uh, yeah. 45 days, especially with it being the year end. It's like, well, if we're going to buy it in January, February, let's buy it in December. And now, 100%, 100%. That's great. New, now, when you when you typically plan out for a new year, do you – I mean, it's not always been 60%. Is that, is this just no. a, an unusual, I mean, or is it typically 10 to 20% or what do you, is it just depend on what, what you want to do? Uh, an acceptable number that we would go for is 20, maybe 15 uh-huh. depends on the timing, depends on what our initiatives are and, you know, what phase or season the company's in. Um, yeah. But I mean, we've had companies that were hundred percent, you know, more than that, that was smaller and it's, it, you know, maybe in theory, it's easier to do that when you're smaller, take more market yeah. share. But um, no, it, it varies it based on yeah. where we're at. So this yeah. last year we did, uh, what was it? It was, we are just talking about this. It was 68%, I believe, okay. last year. Wow. So yeah, we're on a fast trajectory. And part of it is in, internally for me, it's making up for lost time. We've okay. got a few years where we were figuring out our stuff and getting our okay. act together. And so the growth during that wasn't what I would have even been happy with at that time. Sure. You know, if you're moving forward, it's always good. It's learning. learning things. That's absolutely. Yeah. Success this is, is not linear. The school, right? Yeah. 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 No, success is not linear. I say that all the time. Um, so obviously you have a lot to be proud of with those numbers and, and what you're aspiring to do. And I know, you know, you also, you know, Wirenuts won a, a bunch of awards, best place to work for three years, yeah. excellence in cur- customer service, like seven times. I know you've won, I think several SGI awards. So, uh, but but I think something if if you, people talk to you that you're really even more proud of is is the culture that you've kind of built at Wirenut. Um, let's see, I, obviously outstanding pay and benefits. Uh, you if you killed you said to me you killed on call. Is that completely, or do you do that in HVAC even a little bit, or just not at all? No, the only people that run on call are installers who so are doing it. I guess inverse of what most would do. So yeah. what ours is is hey installer, you put in that system and if there's any issues with it after hours within that first week, or, you know, then you got to get your butt out there and go fix it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so essentially it really quickly, it teaches them that do it right the first time. Otherwise you might be out there at nine o'clock. And right. the reason that we're doing it that way is we're taking it more as a customer service, you know, yeah. obligation. We, we sure. owe that to them. If they put in a new system or whatever, and it breaks down within the first week, then there's a possibility we didn't do something right. Uh, whereas most companies might, you know, with on call, they're trying to capture that next lead. We're not doing right. It's not right. worth it. It's a personal preference, not saying it's right for everyone. Sure. Sure. It's just for us. It wasn't worth it anymore. No, I like it. I like it. And obviously yeah. people enjoy that. I'm sure your, your, your team doesn't mind not going out at yeah. night all the time. It's um, funny though. I'll get some of them. I just had one of our, uh, newer guys talking to me about it this morning. He asked, Hey, are we going to add on call back in? I said, no. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. Well, I always did really well with it. It's like, I get it. But the problem is it causes so much activity, so much noise, you know, everybody's burned out by it. And then he was talking about when he did it at this other company, when they would lose people, he would end up doing on call every other week. I said, that's right. exactly it. Right. Yeah. Run into that too. Yep. So. No, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, anyway, so I, I, this is all part of things to build in a culture. And to me, mm-hmm. a lot of people have difficulty put wrapping their arms around what culture is. I, I feel like there's a foundation of culture and it starts with, you know, kind of your mission statement, your core values. And when you sent me your chart, which I know is under construction, I was really impressed that you had those on there. 
Um, and and I, let's see, just to share with everyone your mission statement, uh, which I love. It, it's it's very short and easy, to, enriching lives, one home at a time. And uh, your core values are care, family, grow. Again, simple, easy to remember. Kind of maybe speak to what care, family, and grow mean to you guys at, at Wire Nut. Um, so the family one is now just family, but it used to be positive team and family spirits. Mm -hmm. And I'm very much against corporate speak. You know, it's boring. <laughs> and if it's got a 1984 feel to it, with you know, I, I don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. So anyway, um, positive team and family spirits. Well, if you say family, shouldn't it be positive family? I know there's dysfunction in family, but that's not what we're striving for. Sure. Uh, care. Um, we've had a longer version of it, such as um, what was the longer version? I should know this, but I don't. So anyway, obviously, that's why you, you changed have, it. Yeah, well, that's why we changed it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Positive care. You should care about what you're doing. You should care about who you're working with. You should care about yeah. your customer. You care about everything, which also directly ties into enriching lives one home at a time. Our mission statement. Yeah. You right. don't care, then how can you enrich anything? You're just a drain. Right. At that point. Yeah. Um, what was the other one? Oh, grow. Right. Grow is still one that feels like an incomplete word to me. It feels like it should say growth. Okay. But if we called it growth, then it's indirectly, I think, going to imply money, and it's not about money. It's right. about you growing as a person and everything growing. Interesting. Um, you know, who we are, all that. So one of the challenges I give my leadership team all the time, I said, if the company grew by 60%, if the company grew by 50%, any of those numbers, did you grow by 60 or 50, that same percentage? Right. If you didn't, then the company's outgrowing you, and what do you expect to happen next? Right, right. So we have to keep up. So I love we that. do that. We have like quarterly uh, books or audio books, however you want to digest it. Um, yeah. that are assigned and then we have weekly check-ins on that hey how what was your favorite part of it this week which implies you read it which honestly sometimes they're saying uh oh, sorry i didn't read it okay yeah yeah you know, but if that's the norm then that's a problem it's you know. sure sure hey like we were saying before i hit record there's with audio books there's always a way to consume information you know you got to oh, yeah. drive to the, the shop you know you, you got at least 30 minutes here or there you can you yeah. can take chunks at a time so uh, that's interesting. I like that, though. I, I assume to grow because you're so growth forward. It just meant number of growth. But I like that you realize that the, as individuals that support the business, you must grow with it. That's a that's a good takeaway. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, if you want to hear something that's kind of goofy. Yeah. Here I am, the owner of the company, and I should internalize these things and all that. But I really don't. It, to me, it's OK. Unless it's catchy and it's something that we truly believe in, then I'm yeah. not going to. So sure. the mission statement we have right now is the first one I've ever actually memorized. Interesting. Ripping yeah. lives one home at a time is something I believe in. It's something we should be doing, whether it's the vendor, the customer, the right. guy that drops off water bottles to the, I don't care who it is, you know, we should be doing that. We should be a positive um, influence. And so that's one of those things, being that positive influence, you can carry that out to generations and hopefully create yeah. less, you know, societal chaos. I mean, I like, I, you know, and I appreciate, you know, mission statements and vision statements in, that are elaborate and well thought out. But the problem is people forget them, right? And then they live yeah. in a wall, maybe, you know, and and then they get forgotten about. But by by summarize, it's hard to summarize all that into one sentence. But but by doing that, it, it is more impactful and it's more memorable. So I, I like that a lot. Now yeah, I have to ask our mission statement for about three or so years, and okay. I don't because I think that's kind of a long term one that I don't think we'll have to modify. Sure. means it'll even be stickier so right sorry go ahead right. no no that's okay i just know we've got a bunch of stuff i want to i want to get with you because uh and your time is yeah. valuable but on that uh, that org chart you have you also had seven different statements and i i kind of call them edicts and i and i'll ask you what those are specifically I'm gonna, i want to read those for everyone because i thought they were very interesting and i could tell there was a lot of thought put into it so these were seven things that that trent also had on his org chart and the first one is we coach we train we help the second is we are the platform to work on a better self. Third is we all do what it takes and we set the standard for what's possible. Four is we move fast and sometimes break things, but we also fix them. Five, we confront issues directly, quickly, honestly. Six, we predict to the best of our ability. And seven is having a great culture does not mean that everyone thrives at our company. Those willing to put in the work will thrive. Okay, what are those? Those are really interesting to me expectations really in a nutshell um wire nut is a compilation of what i'd venture to guess probably hundreds of sgi companies mm -hmm. so some of these are ideas from others that i've caught 
Uh, yeah. Some of them are, you know, I got an idea from someone else and then I took it and said, how can we turn that into our own? All of yeah. that. That's the beauty of the group, of course, you know, um, skipping steps, as Jimmy stated recently. Sure. You know, do you want to skip steps or you want to have to go through them all? So right. <laughs> uh, in here, though, these are just expectations. It's kind of as simple as that. I don't have a whole lot of high expectations from this, though, because it is on an org chart. Yeah. And unless people actually care about and look at the org chart, and unless it's shown everywhere and everything else, then it's not going to ever change any action. For, sure. So in all honesty, it's a reminder of what we already know. Right. And it just be one more touch point on that same messaging. No, I like it, but obviously it tells where, to me, where your your mind is of how you think about your company in leading it. So, and I, and I thought there's a lot of really just honest thoughts in there. I mean, I, the last part especially, I think is 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 good for all people to hear that you know not everyone's right for your company, you know, and that's okay, you know. And I think people really struggle with that, especially that start with us right away. You know, they're happy for a pulse number one, and then and then they think they got someone who's great because maybe they're a great salesperson, but they're just terrible person right and that so that means that person's not right either so i thought those were very insightful i i think that's important you hit on something that's very important there's you know most all of us we're all trying to figure out that that line when is enough enough and we're done letting that person just bleed out the company or cause strife or do whatever they're doing that you know is not a good fit or just plain plain not perform that's incredibly important though to do something with um I think back to a story my dad told me. So he ran a small contracting company. Um, it was construction, heavy construction. There was a guy that he had terminated. I'll give the nutshell version. And um, for whatever reason, he had terminated him. Many years later, my dad is having lunch at a restaurant and this woman walks up and she says, hey, you're Bob Urban, right? He goes, yeah. She goes, you used to employ my husband, you know, whatever his name was. And he goes, oh, crap. He's sitting there thinking to himself, oh, great. And she, yeah. she says, I just wanted to thank you for what you did by terminating him. And wow. he was so stunned. He's like, what do you mean? Tell me more about yeah. that. She said, he wasn't producing at the company, which is why you made that action. But he also wasn't producing as a father or a husband or anything else. And wow. by you doing that, it forced him to come to terms with what he was neglecting in his life. And he actually turned around and changed it. And now we have a great relationship. And he's, he's turned it all around because of this. Wow. So the message in that is if somebody sucks at their job, they know it. Yeah. It's, by you telling them, it's not a big surprise. They're, yeah. They're like, oh, wait, I thought I was killing it. No, yeah. they know it. Do something right. about it. Have the guts to do something about it because all you're doing is letting them take up a seat of somebody that actually does care and right. it will do something with it. And, and if you want to also get over the pain of letting them go or mo- letting them move on, they're going to be happier somewhere where they're better suited. Yeah. No, that's really good. I like that story a lot. Now, now when you were when you were building your these core values out, you know your your mission statement and all these you know these seven st- statements. I do, is that something you put together as a leadership team, or is that something that came to your mind and you go, hey guys, this is what I want Wirenut to be. I, this uh, is good. I'm asking this for, for smaller companies that are trying to go. Oh, you know, we need to do that. So, you know, what would you tell them? Uh, that one came from me. I did it in a silo. So. Uh-huh. Um, the one of we move fast and sometimes break things, but we also <laughs> fix them. That's the long version of a phrase that I've been harping into the team. Yeah. Uh, move, move fast and break. Can I use the word? Move yeah. fast and break shit. That's what I tell <laughs> That's them. Right. And I, I exaggerate it for that reason. Like move fast and break shit. Like yeah. please do. The reason is, is otherwise you get different personalities and I have them too. Some of them don't want to make a mistake. Right. And what do you learn by never making a mistake? Not much. Yeah. yeah. I, I like that. I like that. Now, now, when you when you make decisions in the business, I mean, and you're a growing company, obviously, and you really want to grow. That's there's a lot of change that comes with growth. It has to, right? Because you can't do the same thing. No. How much do you think about culture when you're adding all these people or you're making changes? Is that something that's always in the forefront of how the ripple effect will be? Yeah, it's a pretty big one, honestly. That's something that I was on the long path on that. It took me forever to figure out the true payback of culture. Um, yeah. I always cared about it to some extent, but I, well, I always cared about it. I wanted people to enjoy their, their workspace and all of that and each sure. other, but I wasn't sure how to get it all together. And I wasn't sure how you can create an environment of all friends and everything else. And I'm not saying yeah. that everybody here is friends, but sure. it, I've seen the financial impact of making those decisions, changing from a transactional company to a relational company. 
that yeah. was probably the the big difference. And the reason I say I was on the long track is I've seen examples, amazing examples of what culture should have been. And for yeah. whatever reason, it took us this long to really emulate that. Yeah. I, I Like so, I said earlier, I think like mission statement, all that stuff is the foundation. But what else did you do to become a, a relationship company versus a transactional one? Is there other little tidbits you can share with people? Yeah. Um, it's hard to hard to capture all those and, I'm, right. and uh, by no means are we doing it perfectly this is just sure sure yeah. um one which some people could think is probably stupid if somebody puts in a two-week notice we always 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 let them serve out that two-week notice unless okay. they're stealing or so we have some proof or they're or they all of a sudden become a jerk you know yeah. then okay get out of here you're just, we're wasting each other's time but right. the reason for that one little subtlety is think of all the companies that as soon as they put in notice they let them go yeah. Yeah, that means nobody ever has a chance to close out what they needed to close out correctly. They never have a chance to truly say goodbye. They never have a chance to do any of that. It's just closed out with animosity. And we yeah. used to be. There. And yeah. so um, I made a promise years ago to the to the team. I was going to call them the guys at the time. They mostly were. Now we're, yeah. you know, we're, we're well more diversified. Sure. Um, and I said, hey, you guys want to know that you can pay your mortgage next month. And I want to know that I can rely on you next month in the beer. And yeah. so I'm going to make an agreement with you. You will always know where you stand with us and you can act on that or not act on that, but you always know where you stand on that uh, with yeah. us. And so you're never going to be surprised. You're not, you should never ever be in a situation where you're wondering, crap, can I pay my mortgage next month? The only right. time you'd be in that situation is if you made a conscious effort to say, I just don't care enough to correct it, or I'm right. incapable of correcting it, either of which means you need to leave. Right. And so right. we made that dedication. So I guess to back to your question, um, we let them do that. We we have a lot, a lot of trust in the company. And that mm. is one hell of a hard thing to build because sure. you do have to change things. And that means when you change things, they have to understand why. And some yep. of them won't ever understand why because yep. you didn't communicate it well or they didn't pay attention. Right. And that's where that's where the trust comes in. But it's so much easier when they do trust. I was going to say, you you hit on the word I think is big with a lot of uh, companies that have strong culture. It stems with communication. Like if you make decisions, we want to do this, we want to we want to represent this. You gotta you can't you can't just keep that in your own. You gotta you gotta share that with the team and what that means for them, right? I mean, mm -hmm. is that a big part of it? Is how it affects them and how it can help them? It is, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just this morning, I had a uh, meeting. Um, with one of our plumbers and he has aspirations to be a service manager. Okay. And so the, which I think he's capable of it. And the discussion was, and I asked him for his input. I didn't go in there with, Hey, this is what we're going to do. And I didn't know what we were going to do you know, until yeah. coming out of the meeting. My point was uh, one option is he goes in as an assistant service manager and learns the ropes. So he's not yeah. inundated and just overwhelmed right. by, by offering him that I directly asked him, Hey, can you take this lower track? and accept that we're gonna plug somebody in above you, somebody you don't even know, because we interviewed him and we're thinking of bringing him on too. Are yeah. you okay with this? Will that work for you? What do you see as the problem? You know the team better than this guy does, and you know the team better than I do. Yeah. So there's that option, or we plug you in as service manager right away, you get overwhelmed, you get all, maybe not overwhelmed, that might not be fair, but you get all of the responsibility, you get all, you know, everything comes with it, and you better be able to learn fast. Yeah. So. What I loved about it is he came from the approach of what's best for the company. And um, wow. we, we left it with, hey, you know, I see a few options here and I'm going to give myself some time to process these, get some feedback from some of the other managers, and then we'll know which way to go. And yeah. regardless, he stated, I'm okay either way. I'm good. I yeah. don't need it today. I don't need it tomorrow. Um, right. I, just, I care more about it being right. So That's that great. Was, that was really cool. That's really cool. I mean, I guess how long has that guy been with you? I mean, it can't be too long, right? A couple of years if plumbing's relatively no long. plumbing. I would say plumbing was about just over a year old, realistically. Before that, we were kind of figuring it out. Um, Preston, how long has he been here? I don't know. Yeah, uh, well, he, he, either way, he's probably I, right about a year. Yeah, because I, I asked this to say that I, you know he sees that this is a growing organization and that other opportunity will come along like this isn't a, a small business that's stuck being a small business where if he doesn't get this job now he's never going to get it because that guy might because hopefully right. i'm assuming you're going to want to 
have 20 plumbers and you're going to have to have two or three service managers right so so he kind of sees that based on the, the company's you know progression so that's pretty cool he does. Very, he actually, um, as long as this brings value to the podcast, I'll offer this up. Uh, he actually was talking about how he was in some drains companies before. Mm-hmm. He knew that what he was finding wasn't what he wanted. Mm-hmm. He wasn't sure what he wanted until right. he went through. And he said, I intentionally, when I left there, uh, the last place, I intentionally was looking for um, a clear answer on what I really wanted. So he said, I in- interviewed with 10 companies and I would not wow. interview with any less. And he said, you guys were number nine, and I picked you four, and he went into those reasons. So, again, I'm not touting – it sounds like I am, actually, but I'm not trying to tout I how amazing we are. I'm touting how intentional we are. Yes. And that intentionality is around what people actually want. Right. And we owe that to them. You know, yeah. surround, surround everyone with people that are like-minded and like-capable, you know, similar yeah. capabilities. Um, mm-hmm. And those that don't fit, that's okay. Yeah. Stop, stop carrying that. So he started uh, February 9th of 2021. Okay. Wow. Yeah. All right. So almost a year. Almost yeah. a year. Very good. All right. Well, I want to I want to pivot a little bit uh, from more cultural to more organizational structure. I know at SGI we've been building or, or sample org charts for people to start thinking about putting those together so they can think about how to rationally grow. And I know you're working on yours, um, but yeah. I, I just think it's interesting for people that aspire to get bigger what kind of staff you need and who, you know, and all that stuff. So let's talk uh, just for you specifically, who directly reports to you, Trent? Uh, John Post. He's okay. been historically been titled operations manager because mm-hmm. I always had, well, there's a couple of things. I wasn't sure what a general manager would really, really do. And my best picture of it was that I could vanish for a month or so. And right. not only would it stay on its rails, the company that is, but it would also thrive. And so um, he's historically been operations manager, and then this was like an impromptu, not official, but we're, we know where we're going now. Uh, yep. Just a few weeks ago, because of that org chart, um, the agreement or decision has been that John's going to be our general manager. Oh, and that's great. Good guy. I have been gone for a month, and it's been perfectly fine. So yep. I think he's I think he's earned it. Yeah, for sure. So he he's really technically the only one that reports to you. Everyone else reports to him then. Uh, John and then Michelle does. I still keep um close involvement with finance and sure so michelle is uh, bookkeeping yeah. mm-hmm. and so I, i'm kind of the onboard cfo still i just when i bought out my brother i had to learn all the little intricacies of all that and sure. all the little areas i didn't know that forced it out of me because at that same time i was cleaning up our reporting and getting um, funding on an sba loan so i basically worked for wells fargo for about six months <laughs> <laughs> so it taught me how to be a decent CFO, you know. Yeah, yeah, so, for sure. So great. At some okay, point, so, we'll fill that role too. Okay. So those two are your primary reports. Um, they are. All right. Then, so for John, who who directly reports to him though? Can you? I mean, I, can you just give a sample of what that looks like? I think I actually skipped a step. So marketing is another one that's kept I've kept close. Okay. That's one that I understand because I've been so involved in it. I used to do it myself. Sure. I still stay involved in the brainstorming and our our TV yeah. strategies, all those kinds of things. So marketing is yeah. involved there. John is somewhat involved with marketing as well. Sure. Um, so then if I go into who's who's reporting to John, it would be our service managers. Uh-huh. And then call center manager. Mm-hmm. And these are some of the things we're toying around with on the org chart. So Sure. Uh, we're going in more of a support structure role versus a um, so support role versus production role. Okay. So production is our our day to day sales and revenue, and our support is if you wanted to uh, say that there was like one corporate hub, and I just said earlier I don't like corporate, but yeah. one corporate hub. What are the things that that location does? Those would be marketing, call center, um, IT, right, uh, vision. And, uh, finance, those kinds of things. So those are those are more under the support side. Sure, that's for sure. More thing. Right, yeah. right. So no, okay, yeah, no. And then Jonathan is more the production, which is how, now. How many service managers do you r- roughly have? Like, do you abide by? You no, know, Gus always talks about about ten people, roughly. You know, you, one merch right. manager can kind of. Is that what you kind of loosely use as a as a guide? Yeah, we've tried. Um, <laughs> 
we pop in or plant whatever a service manager in place when we're six to eight. Okay. Yeah. And once it gets to 15, ideally in a perfect world, then we get another one, which then gets us back to that eight, you know, by splitting sure. them in half. Sure. So uh, the problem is we haven't been doing that. So instead we've been putting <laughs> 25 or more under uh -huh. one service manager while we find the next person. So that's though also where one of our big um, initiatives has been is finding those next leaders. Sure. So about six months ago, I was telling the team, I said, we have got to get better at growing and finding leadership. So we can find leadership, but basically then we're adopting the training that somebody else had put into that person. Whereas if we grow them, then you know we're growing them, it takes more time and everything, but we've got to be sure. thinking about that so we have that time to put in. Yeah. So uh, one of those big issues has been finding them and then growing them. So then we've been really working on that. So we've got um, in that model, in that org chart, we've got the assistant service manager model. That's yeah. basically our training in place kind of model. Interesting. So okay. we've brought in Justin recently on the electrical side as an ASM. Uh, I was asking Preston whether he was going to go in on the ASM role or full service manager. The ASM yep. would give him that training without being overwhelmed. Right. Um, on the HVAC side, we're doing less of an ASM model. We're doing more of a sales versus install model. And so we uh -huh. have Lee, who's our install manager. And mm -hmm. he's newer with us also. Uh, he comes from out of state, so he's figuring out the differences of Colorado from Texas. Yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, just the team and all of that. Sure, sure. So we're, <laughs> we're breaking the teams up more, more and more, but that also goes into that trust thing. They have built such great trust with their uh, technicians that whenever we do that, it steps or runs the risk of stepping on that trust. So. I like this idea of the assistant manager role. So what, what does that person do on a day-to-day -day basis? Is he running a truck too? So he's productive or no, you just say, Hey, I'm going to invest funds in you to learn and to help. And, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, we have a maintenance. So we have a maintenance to service to, it depends on what path they take, but uh, maintenance to the progression could be maintenance to service to, to sales and install based on their uh, personality. So yeah. anyway, on the maintenance side, the ASM is taking on the maintenance team. Okay. And the maintenance team's primary job is to run our membership visits, which we finally are good at selling. Uh, for the yeah. many years, I didn't believe in membership. <laughs> yeah, right. So now we've got a bunch of them, we've got to run them. Yeah. And uh, so in that, we uh, we have the assistant service manager overseeing the maintenance side, which they run those visits, and then um, they follow a structured process that allows them to identify the things that are out of manufacturer spec. That's what we consider it. You know, electrical, HVAC, plumbing, we're all built to spec, to manufacturer spec for that product, for that you know equipment, to code, whatever. So as it slips, you know, over time, it's going to be out of spec. And so that's the verbiage we use. So they're checking for manufacturer specs on all of these different items. When they find items that are out of spec, then they get somebody else out there to get a second set of eyes on it, confirm it, and then communicate the benefits of, of upgrading or, you know, replacing or whatever. And okay. so it also gives that maintenance tech on-site training. So oh. anyway, the ASM is over that team, making sure okay. that they're hitting their metrics and that they understand their their role and and that they're trained and all of those. Yeah, so. very good. So it's basically, they're learning how to be a manager over the people that are learning how to be the next step in technician. Interesting, okay, very good. Now the managers, the assistant manager, they're all tech, they all have a technical background, right? It sounds yeah. like I'm assuming, no, they don't. Okay, so let's talk about that then. What, what do you think the mix is tech versus non-technical? The HVAC side is, the side, well, no, Justin has some electrical. So the HVAC side has two previous technicians. Um, in fact, I think you've met Andrew. He's mm -hmm. our oh, yeah. HVAC, HVAC sales manager. He came yeah. from yeah. Uh, Bob's out in Kansas City. So he's one of those oh, where somebody okay. else trained him and we you know, brought him on and got to adopt him. Sure. <laughs> uh, uh, Lee has experience from HVAC in Texas. And then yeah. Tanya came from medical. She was an army medic and then she ran medical clinics and she just wanted to change the pace and always admired yeah. the trades. Yeah. So uh, she's learned the, the electrical and plumbing. We had that under her too um, okay. from being here. Justin has some electrical. So yeah. And then the person that I interviewed just the other day that we were considering bringing on for plumbing and or drains. Yeah. Um, 
he has uh, experience in the trucking industry, so not the trades, but kind of relevant. Yeah. yeah. So I like that you're you're open to it. So when when you're interviewing these people for management jobs, what um, what certain traits, um, work histories, what are what are things that you're looking for that make those people successful in your business? One of the first things is they don't get stuck in the muck. Okay. Uh, it's real easy to do when you get technicians doing the role. They're used to that's the value that they bring is they're 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 really in depth into the technical. Yeah. Well, once you get into a management role, if you're really stuck in the technical, then you're not letting the people in the field do their job. And yeah. on top of that, you're not probably following your metrics because how can you be stuck in technical and care about the growth of that person and his family and whether or not he's paying his bills through his production, whether he's trained correctly, all those kinds of things. Sure, sure. One thing that I have a big thing against is dial a code book. If you're somebody <laughs> okay. in the field and your manager is just dial a code book, then yeah. something's broken. There's a big dysfunction there. Yeah. Periodically call your manager when you need support. Sure. Or, uh, you know, ideally really call the other people. They're the ones that are living and breathing it. Like right. me, if I go out and I'm going to wire up a hot tub these days, I'm going to call one of my electricians first. Sure. I don't, sure. I'm not sure of all the codes that have changed and I'm right. the master electrician for the company but I don't sure. know what the codes have changed and I'm going to screw something up. So yeah, yeah. they're in it every day. They're the ones that should have that, that uh, knowledge. Right. That's so that's one thing we look for. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of personality profile type you're using per se, but use something. Yeah. And one of them that we're looking for is uh, some level of autonomy that okay. you don't have to be told every day what you should be working on. Cause if you're in a leadership role, that's not acceptable. Right. Um, I was telling you about the person that we brought on, uh, John. He, yeah. like I said, I, when we were talking before we started, he's been with us for what two, two and a half weeks. I've worked with him. Today's the third day in person, and he's autonomous. Yeah. It may when you have the right people, it makes things easier. Yeah. So that's an important one. Okay. Any so the autonomy, uh, they don't get stuck in the muck. Anything else that you know that that, that you always look at when when they have to. An absolute is they can't be selfish. Okay. Yeah. They've For called sure. it servant leadership in different circles, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think to expand on that for a moment, nothing against technicians. We train them for this, but we train them to be self-centered. Yeah. They're in the field. Their numbers are what they're tracked on. Their, yeah. their production, their quality, their communication with the customer, whatever. The, everything yeah. is tracked directly on them. And then we pull them out of the field and we say, hey, now you have to not only be poured into, we're never going to acknowledge you anymore, but you have to acknowledge everybody else. That's a pretty big ask. That's a good point. And, yeah. And so I think that's one of those sabotage pieces that we have with technicians. Mm -hmm. you know, because then you go into middle management and you're stuck underneath upper management where they're saying, hey, here's what's expected and you got to deliver. And then you've got uh, the people that you're taken care of or working for, you know, the technicians and such, yeah. and they need things from you. And so it can just turn into a lot of activity that they don't expect and they're not prepared for. That's interesting. That's very interesting. You, um, do you use, just to kind of backtrack for a brief second, in, in, in trying to analyze people and where the strengths are, do you use culture index or do you have your own thing that you kind of use? We used to use DISC and then we switched over to culture index. Culture index. How long have you had that in place? Um, just over a oh, year. Wow. Okay, for over a year. Did they onboarded it, with a bunch of others. So Carrie yeah. onboarded at the same time and, and some others. So yeah. Was that enlightening? Did you see certain people in, in certain seats that maybe didn't shouldn't have been there, or did you feel like you had done a good job and in, in reading people, just not having it put in in front? Uh, of it's you? been pretty enlightening. It's yeah. been yeah. I actually though, so I lean on Amanda. She's our recruiter. I lean on her more to be our guru of culture index, and she knows. Uh -huh. that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And so I know what the A one is. It's autonomy. The B and C I screw up all the time and so forth. But they have A, B, C, and D. So yeah. uh, those have been helpful, but so was DISC. And yeah. we've done uh, Wonderlick in the past. That was helpful. Oh, yeah. That's what the NFL used last year. Sure. Time. Oh, yeah. Um, overall, though, oh, one thing we learned that our install team, that there's a reason that they've had higher callbacks. They're not wired exactly for that precision, that attention to detail. 
So it was interesting. So that means, okay, we can train this in them, but why were the callbacks high? Well, it's that. Yeah. Um, the autonomy one is a big one for me that I try to watch for. That's what I think would correlate on disc over to the D. You yeah. Know, on, on the oh, D yeah. ISD. And then, um, so they all, they, they seem to have four quadrants. Yeah. Yeah. So for the installer issue, what, I mean, if someone's not wired to be, you know, specific and very detailed, what do you do? Like, did you just change who you, your installers or, or did you, you know, in the other installers, they found another we place for them? Some of them to roles that made more sense, but honestly, most of them, they're still doing that role and, and yep. we've just worked around that. Yeah. Yeah. Just train. Train, 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 yeah. train. Like yeah. a checklist, oh. different things they can they can uh, get better as a result sure. of the right team. Sure. Um, you mentioned Jonathan, so let's go ahead and talk about his role. Kind of share with everyone what you shared before I hit record. What what he's doing for WireNet right now. Um, his title currently is support, and what that means it's a lot of the initiatives that I've been trying to work on for quite some time. Yep. Many of which none of my managers even knew were on my radar. So yep. what I would do is if I had that thought or that, you know, light bulb would go off or whatever, hey, this is something we need to do. And then yep. others that they did know about. And so then it's a matter of timing. It's, you know, how high up on your totem pole of priorities do you want to run it up? Sure. And uh, what was happening is John Post, I was, he and I were working on some of these. So I can go all in on task manager mode. But if I do, I'm a little dismissive and I don't have a whole lot of time for, you know, people. And so is that really the best use of my time? Yeah. I've done that in the past a lot, so I'm acquainted with it. And in a way, by getting out of it, I have to actually get more comfortable with, which I've been doing. Um, yeah. But it's nice when that happens. And so that means, okay, well, if I'm not going to do all these initiatives and these things yeah. that are for the future, then is John Post, the operations, and you know, now GM going to do it? Well, he's in the day-to-day. Yeah, he's got a lot. He's pulled on on a lot. He's yeah responsible for a lot of things. And so then which one of us is going to be enslaved by this? And the answer was, well, it's just not <laughs> going to happen all that this. quick. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it wasn't happening all that quick. And so that was the initiative. And really, it, it was a matter of timing. Um, so when I was talking to the management team, we either have to grow or find, or better yet, both uh, yeah. leadership. That was one of those situations. So John... His wife, as I understand it, his wife is friends with Andrew's wife. And Andrew recognized that, hey, John seems to have some traits that I think would be beneficial for our team. And yeah. I thought that was very creative for him to have that on his radar. He didn't have to. Yeah. And yeah. so after the whole team sitting on this guy of John, you know, with his resume for quite a while, I was challenging him saying, what are we doing here with him? I, yeah. I don't know. Nobody knows what to do. He's like, let's just do something because just sitting there <laughs> drives me nuts. So yeah. set up an interview and I want to just meet him. I want to just see where it goes. And yeah. so we met neither of us, none of us knew where it was going, what we were even doing in there other than we're going to see if there's an alignment. Yeah. Um, we ended up recognizing an alignment, figuring out what the cost of it was, what the impact of it would be, all of that, and yeah. just pulled the trigger. And then wow. I vanished for two weeks. So. <laughs> but you said he's, he hit the ground running. Yeah, yeah, he has. One so thing how, I want to quote from him that I just yeah. loved hearing. I just heard it today. Yeah. He quote, uh, to quote him, he said, the most trusting culture that I've ever walked into. Wow. So if they weren't, and I was gone, and I wasn't there to, you know, to poke and prod this this process, then yeah. he would have run out of things perhaps to do. Instead, uh, I think the, the last I've checked, he's overwhelmed with things. Yeah. So, in That's a good great. Way. That's cool. So, so you had, had shared with me before again. I hit record, or we started this. That you had like a list of what twenty things you wanted to implement, right? That these that are now his responsibility. So, what what are some things? Like, is it is this written? Just getting processes more written down and detailed. So, you know, if someone leaves, the company's not exposed, and it's not you know you lose that person's knowledge. And now we got to figure out how to, how that department runs, right? So, or what what you, you share with everyone? Yeah. So. Um... What I expressed to John when we were going through the whole process is that we followed kind of an 80-20 rule. 80% of the stuff was documented. 80% of the stuff we knew what we were dealing with and 20% of the things we hadn't addressed or we hadn't documented. It was just running on sheer talent and right. trust and all of that. And this is one of the benefits of switching from a transactional to a relational business. 
back before I had to shore up so many things and it was easier to do when we were smaller because there was less things and I was closer to them. For sure. So I knew, okay, if they leave, what am I going to have to take over? What's somebody else going to have to take over? And what are our risk points and all of that? And what passwords do they have? I mean, yeah. I guarantee there's listeners or viewers thinking, oh crap. Yeah. I've never thought of that. And I have other friends in the group that they share their passwords with everybody. I'm like, well, you might be going the opposite. Yeah. Direction. So the point is, um, those things are just never fully documented, never tightened up. So we've run on that sheer talent and that trust, and that's gotten us a long ways now. And it's my job is so much easier as a result than it used to be. But yeah. we've got to close those gaps at some point. And one of our big things, the nut we're trying to crack is remote offices. We could go okay. pop in remote offices right now, but I'm yeah. not going to do it with any inferiority over what we're doing here. Right. And so when we do it, it's going to be done right. That means the culture has to be bottled as best possible. The processes have to be bottled, all these things in order for us to then transplant it and go. And when we do it and we go to that scale, it's going to be easier and at least hopefully unstoppable versus okay. doing it and having chaos. Because okay. we've done that with a remote office and it turned out to where you're, you're getting five cents back for every dime or dollar that you expend in effort or money. And it just yeah. doesn't make sense. Right. Right. Not until okay. you got it. Not to me. Yeah. You, for you sure. want with your own, but you know. So, so John's role, uh, is, I mean, is this where you have, you had like 20, 30 things you wanted him to do. Is there an expectation of when he'll get these all achieved or are you just going to meet with him every week or I mean, again, for people in, in, intrigued by this role, like I am, uh, what, what is, you know, what kind of expectations have you set in front of him? what's cool is he's actually come to me with those. So we have a cadence or a frequency in where we're meeting. Yeah. Um, I don't want to misquote it. Let me, let me look at next week. If I can find it. Okay. So we have a Friday mid morning meeting. I know that that's a recurring. Okay. Um, so that's a regular check-in. Like We've it. got um, one called core process confirmation brief for next Friday. So we're going through our core processes and dialing those in making sure that our technology uses the same verbiage that our team does and that our communication is there and our resources are easy and, and all of that. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's one thing I did tell him, I said, if I'm not here or not, a, whatever, call me and we'll, you know, if it's something quick, we'll knock it out. And if it needs a video chat, we'll do it that way too. And yeah, yeah. All of that. And so <laughs> yeah, it's a learn as we go thing, but um we have a task, a task management software that we use, and on there, we put in deadlines also. Of, hey, here's what should be worked okay. on there. But that all has to be conscious of and involved with our um, EOS process. I feel like I'm jumping around a lot, but that's all right. EOS is our, it's called a Entrepreneurial Operating System. It's okay. based on the, um, was it Carnegie Habits or the Rockefeller Habits? Okay. Um, and in essence, so we meet every quarter, we set our initiatives for the next quarter. Those initiatives are called rocks. The reason yep. for that is put the rock in and you can put the foot pebbles in around it. But if you put all the pebbles in, you don't have room for the rocks anymore. Yep. And so our rocks are the things that come hell or high water, those need to be knocked out. We have had slippage on that, you know, at times, but if we get at least 80% of those knocked out each quarter, then that's considered a success. Yeah. So uh, we have our rocks. Those are the big initiatives that are really going to move things. And we actually have our quarterly planning session uh, tomorrow. We would do those offsite for a full day. Yep. And then annually we do them for two days. Um, so all of this ties into that. Typically what we'll find is we have one big initiative that has little tertiary little pieces to it. And those sure. are the things that can have more short-term milestones and, and get those knocked out before the rock is due that next quarter. Yeah. But it's made okay. a huge difference for us. Yeah. That's when one of the things that changed the company from me hating it and considering selling it mm -hmm. to me being able to get my hands around it, enjoy it, and, and fill it full of the people that we like. For example, uh, we have a um, tool from that called the People Analyzer, and okay. it analyzes right person, right seat. We used to be down in the, I don't know, I think it was 60s or 70s, probably 70s. Yeah. And now we're, I'll find out tomorrow, but we're consistently way up in the 90s, that's meaning great. that we've been picky with who's here and, and protective of that. Yeah, so. that's great. 
So getting the right people on the right bus and maybe having those quarterly goals, right, that, that you can accomplish that gives you that sense of accomplishment versus just kind of maybe trucking through a year and keeping an eye on the numbers. You feel like you're growing something. It gives you something to aspire to hit. I like that. That's good stuff. Get Very the ball good. on the same path too, rowing right. the same direction. Right. Yeah. I like that. Um, all right. There was I want to stagnation before that. There was a lot of stagnation. You said. When was the growth stagnated as well? Yeah, we had. I can. I tell them all. Uh, basically, I wasted three years, and I mean that and don't mean it. I learned a lot I was during say, that. Learn. Yeah, 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 yeah. But those three years weren't filled with excitement. weren't filled with growth. weren't filled with me enjoying it. Yeah, um, I spoke at a panel a little while back. That's when I was considering, like, maybe I just go do something else with a different team that has different resources. And, yeah. You know, so I have no desire for that anymore. And in this world, hell, I'm getting hit up three times a week to sell. And I'm like, no. And I enjoy selling <laughs> every time. Support for this podcast comes from Insincorator. Insincorator is the world leader in food waste disposers and holds over 200 patents on fine grinding and quiet technology innovations. Based and assembled here in the United States, Insincorator produces the popular Badger series and offers many upgraded disposers, such as the Pro series built for plumbers and builders to meet the needs of the more demanding customer. Visit Insincorator.com to learn more. Leak Smart. LeakSmart is the world's most intelligent and reliable leak and flood protection system. It detects water leaks instantly, automatically shuts off a home's main water supply in five seconds or less to prevent any further water damage and notifies homeowners and installers immediately. Whether on its own or integrated into an existing smart home system like Nest, LeakSmart makes it easier for homeowners to protect their entire home from water damage 24-7, even if internet and the power go out. Provide your customers with the best defense against catastrophic water damage and install a LeakSmart system today. To learn more, visit us at www.leaksmart.com. Welcome back to the show. I'm talking with Trent Urban of Wiring and Home Services in Colorado Springs, Colorado. We've covered a lot so far, and we have a lot more to go. Trent's going to talk about what his recruiter does for the business. We're going to talk about the WireNut school that's in the making. We're going to talk more about Trent's desire to build a remote office and so much more. So let's jump back into my conversation with Trent Urban of WireNut Home Services in Colorado Springs, Colorado. All right. Well, I want to talk about you because you mentioned Amanda's name and it's a hot topic. It's been forever. Talent acquisition, trying to find people. So is she operate solely looking for people? Does she have a staff with her or talk about your recruiting role at WireNut? She, that's all she does. That's all she does. Okay. And then we, she's been tr um, trying to locate her uh, partner in crime here for a little bit too. Mm -hmm. um, Amanda's a process oriented person. And so she's really good with getting all that together, hitting her deadlines, communicating them, taking the bull by the horns. Now we're trying to also find another person to be kind of that communicator that goes out and maybe uh, boots on the streets and yeah. trade shows and whatever, you know, bad examples in there and good uh, trade sure. schools. So we're trying to do that because the question that I asked before was, if we had two Amandas, would we get double the amount of people? Because right. there is a case where you just don't have enough in the funnel. Or there's a case where you just don't have enough resources, you know, people to chase them down. So right. uh, we're still looking for her help, but that's part of the problem. We're looking for her help, service managers and more technicians and and the leadership thing that is, you know, on her side, you know, distraction because it's not an urgency thing if we're not careful. So we have to be mm -hmm. real careful about this. So we have uh, weekly recruiting meetings in there. We have all the positions listed. Okay. And how many we're supposed to have and how many we have. So actual versus budget. And yeah. every single role has that number. And any of the roles that have a gap, then it's, all right, got to go fill these. It could be eight roles. It could be two roles. It's yeah. really number two. But. So anyway, that's that's how she uh, is on top of it. And it's full-time job. Oh, I bet. Uh, what, like, where is it mostly just, on, you know, answering online, you know, people, you know, applying online or where where are we finding people is it just the branding that you have in the community i'm sure you got to be getting a number of people from out of state potentially i mean talk about where you're finding people uh we will run ads in some of the depressed areas um, oh okay hopefully there's no members that are funded by this but we uh we hit up albuquerque and santa fe new mexico and things like that and have for quite yep. a while um 
that's one of those examples. We also have the advantage of this is Colorado and a lot of people sure. you know, were, I don't know, I know everywhere's booming, but I feel like we're booming like crazy and that we're on oh, yeah. the map and it just feels that way in this small town. You yeah. know, Colorado Springs is 600, it used to be 400,000, now it's 600. It's not that wow. big of a city. Yeah. And um, we've kind of hit the tipping point where we're more of a city now, right. like it or hate it, you know, here it is. And um, so anyway, we get a lot of people that want to come to Colorado. They want to live there. And so sure. they're now considering Colorado Springs over Denver yeah. um, more than they ever have. Yeah. And so uh, we've got that. We also, because of really, really shifting the culture and the relational side of the company, there's a lot of chatter out there around town, a lot of like, yeah. good chatter. Um, an example of that is, I think it was last week, early last week, um, I interviewed a guy that is shutting down his plumbing company that he's had for you know, 15 years or so. Yeah. And he wants to join us. He, want, he wanted to join us as a service manager of some sort, but also to sell his company as resources. Um, he's supposed yeah. to be giving me a list of those assets now, but he did so. He approached us because he felt like we were the place. He said, I hear a lot of good things and I, I know that you guys wouldn't you know be a flash in the pan and all of that and so that's right. really that's really cool to hear and really cool to experience and so it helps yeah. us with recruiting it means sure. we're not aggravating people out in the streets as much yeah. as possible so. yeah 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 so when amanda's listing jobs does she like list them coast to coast you know to to, to draw people in from maybe that are living in uh, i don't know whatever yeah. town that they're like i need it i just want to change it Col everyone loves colorado right a lot of people vacation yeah. there so you know, I just talked to Travis Electrical. They're in, outside of Nashville. Nashville's another town that's like, all right, you know, it's a, it's a destination. So they get people yeah. from all over. Is, have you found the same? We have, yeah. We start with the reciprocal uh, state. So for electrical and plumbing, they have a state license. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have oh, that license yeah. to perform the work. Well, they're reciprocal for, with various states. So we hit those states first. Right. Um, so it'd be a combination of those reciprocals. I can't say we really have done any that are non-reciprocal lately. We're not okay. paying for those at least. Right. Um, keeping up on our online um, platform, yep. one of the things we recently discovered that we weren't doing well and started pushing is Glassdoor, mm. which is important mm. for inter internal reviews. And I sure. actually, for the first time, experienced the uh, reward of that. Um, someone was talking about, hey, I saw all your good Glassdoor reviews, which I need to go look myself. See where <laughs> we're and yeah. uh, and so that made them consider, you know, consider us. Yeah. And uh, so there's that. I think it's like marketing. I've always looked at it like oh, marketing. Yeah. It's a combination of everything. You can't just do one thing. You're, you know, you can't just do TV. You can't just do, you know, pay-per-click. You got to put it all together. Sure. So it's all of that stuff. And then I think it's important that you don't have one that's draining you. We, we have Yelp that's draining us. And I just stopped oh. caring years ago. But what so is the Yelp? Yelp that's, yeah, what is the Yelp of recruiting? That's what you got to go find and see if it's worth fixing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In my so, opinion. So, real, real quick, to follow up on Amanda's role. Does she do the initial interview? Does she have the, someone fill out the culture index thing so you can see where they follow? And then, or, you know, how does the, this, the real quick in a nutshell, what's the process like, the mechanics of the interview process? If I don't screw up the exact details. <laughs> um, in a nutshell, she gets the feelers out there. So we're using um, different platforms to get the feelers out there to get our exposure out. From that, we've got an interview, or not an interview, a uh, candidate. We go through and vet that, see if they hit some of the basic criteria. Yep. For the tradesmen, we realize that we can't really be too picky with that because some of them don't want to go through the paperwork of it. And yeah. so uh, from that, though, set a phone interview then a face-to-face, -face, and then based on the role, it goes through anywhere from two to maybe three face-to-faces. Uh, -face. So for okay. leadership, it's going to be a three. For um, technicians, it's two and so forth. On, in all honesty, I don't know who's joining us until they tell me. And so <laughs> it's yeah, kind of weird, cool. and it's kind of it's more cool than it is cool. weird. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. So, so a technician then, so how many, um, you said what, three? So it was one with Amanda and then two with like a service manager or – do you, like how, and do you have two service man? Do you want to get two separate service managers to interview, even though they may not be reporting that person? So, or, for, or how, what's your approach for the trades for the tech? Yep. It's it's a phone interview, then a face to face. My face to face has Amanda always in the room, yeah, and because she's the ringleader, keep us all together and sure. make sure that there's progress on it. And then also that direct manager that would be over that person. Okay, 
And then from that, they typically are able to make a decision. Sure. And sure. you know, some of the more difficult ones or where there's going to be multiple layers of management, we'll do more. And realistically, I think that's primarily guided by just we don't want to have any more than at max three of us in the room because otherwise it feels like we're crowding up on them and overwhelming yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, but we also have certain people that have to experience that person before they're hired. Right. Right. But okay. we always have at least two. You need witnesses. You need dialogue. Yeah. You need counteracting um, perspectives. All of that. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Very good. All right. I want to shift off from uh, from hiring to to training. Um, let's see. You had eight eight crown champions this year, right? Seven crown and one scoreboard winner, so we'll have eight going up on stage, yeah. That's awesome. Now, is that uh, electrical and HVAC combo? Yes. Excellent. Uh, ele yeah, electrical, HVAC, HVAC and then um, uh, club membership sale. Okay, cool. That was cool. kind of a tricky one. The difference, Sonia helped us a lot on that. The difference between ESI and ASI on membership counts. Yeah. On, on one side, we blow it away, and on the other side, we're in the packs. We're like, where does this person go? So, right. <laughs> yeah. that's funny um now i know you you expressed that you know i think you're you're trying to work on a wire nut school right where yeah. right now who does all like who does all the training now the, the, the managers themselves do the training <laughs> yeah okay service and managers you, do the training uh my exposure to that would be we do quarterly banquets okay so at least there i'm speaking and making sure that i'm in front of and engaged with everybody you know as a whole team Otherwise, uh, we do. We try to do it our best. We're getting more and more and more intentional about this. We were great during the summer, but about yep. uh, monthly gatherings. Yeah. So that communication, but also mostly, really, it's fun. It's not. Sure. So, uh, and then there's some uh, some trainings I'll do. So, like we have a uh, presentation book. I won't call it a price book anymore because there's no prices in it. Yeah. Um, and I had built it or overseen the building of all of it, and it was a very very long process. And so yeah. when it was rolled out, I realized we hadn't yet trained on how to utilize these pages. And yeah. so I did all of that because I knew what, what was expected there, how it was built and everything. Sure. Um, otherwise, it's service managers. Okay. All right. But do you, now, when you mention a wire nut school, do you want to get away from that? Where it, you push the onerous of training onto a, like an internal trainer or trainers so that frees up your service managers to do other Just worry about performance metrics and stuff like coaching and, and stuff like that. Or what are your thoughts for? The wire nut school it's uh that's been one that's very difficult for us to get off the ground we've been talking right. about it for i think it's maybe even three years but at least two yeah so um i think it's it's a bandwidth issue in my opinion again we need somebody to own it because we've tried to do it in our spare time and it's just not happening yeah so we've started identifying and i'm sure tomorrow we'll have a better idea and even more depth Sure. But who's going to do it and what is it? And what I've been pushing all the way through until I'm proven to be wrong is it needs to be very light, very nimble, and almost like a maintenance man kind of level of training. Okay. So uh, hanging a ceiling fan, um, installing a dimmer, doing some basic things like that, because what that allows is when somebody needs that service, we can get somebody out there with those skills. What it also means, though, is do not train them on a ton of Ohm's law, you know, like all the technical stuff. Yeah, don't yeah, yeah. train them on airflow calculations, doing a manual J. Don't train them on that stuff. It's not, yeah. it's premature. So the 101 class would be that, just the entry into the trades. It's been intended yeah. to be, you have no exposure to the trades and this is your first touch point. And if we yeah. throw too many things at you, a confused mind freezes up. So let's not do that. Yeah. Um, then the next class, 102, would be, you know, building on that and then continue, continue. Okay. It's intended to be that it can fast track them. It's not really geared around the licensing so much, but at some yeah. point I would like it to be state accredited so they can get hours towards it. Sure. Um, and I do go back and forth on whether there's a true good ROI on this or not, because a lot of it we can do in the field. The problem with yeah. doing it in the field is it's less intentional and less controlled, less consistent. Yes. So you're talking actual hard skills. I, there's no soft skills I've heard with this. Actually, or is okay, that a separate class? Maybe I expressed it wrong. Here's how to hang a ceiling fan, and here's how to introduce what you're going to oh, do okay. with that fan okay. to the customer, how to present the price. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. So kind of almost a combination of both, or or is it only 
communication then in that regard. It's a combination of both with less is more approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff that is actually relevant, rather, like you said, getting away from the code shenanigans. It's the stuff that you're going to deal with on a day to day. Okay, yeah. very good. So, so Otherwise, you know, if we're just going to do the hard skills and a ton of them, they could go to one of the trade schools. Right. Right. And that is sure. another option. The problem is then you put them in a classroom with a bunch of other competitors. Um, yeah. I won't say it's all bad, but I don't know that I want them around it. And I don't know what we're getting. You know, I've been through some of those and you're like, that guy shouldn't be teaching because he really doesn't. <laughs> it's not a controlled environment. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Yep. This you know what they, they, they get, what they're exposed to. So we, at this point, it is a, it's a concept that you haven't put into motion yet, but you're hoping maybe tomorrow with your quarterly meeting, you guys will put some bones on it. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. And we have a detached garage area where we have done some of it. Most of it's been around the HVAC side. Andrew's done things related to that to yeah. get, you know, some of the basics, the tune-ups, that kind of stuff. Um, but we've got a building uh, being designed. I just closed on the land a couple months ago or a few months ago, whatever, all that. It's going to be done by the end of the year in theory. Okay. We are in COVID time. So. Sure. But uh, <laughs> with that, it has a whole lab and everything built around. So that's okay. really going to, in theory, make it the easiest it's ever been to make it a reality. Do you do you have an, a, a loose outline of what those classes will look like, like one mm -hmm. to 10 or whatever? Okay, you do have that. Okay. Yeah. How much did you did, did you like hit up Gus and some of the other larger members that have I know that have school internal schools in place or or is this just what you have seen what I you believe to be necessary that person has to, to fast track them? Uh, I think it's based on what I believe they need for those necessities. I wasn't yeah. sure if anybody else was operating in the same fashion, you know, with the maintenance maintenance tech and what their role is and and then how to fast track that and speed it up. I do know some members are doing things like this. Yeah. Uh, George is doing some things. He was telling me that he does all of his training in the field. So this would be a different take from that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I realized that I haven't been to Gus's place in a while. Yeah. Uh, but I have some managers that had gone out there and they were talking about it. And so I was thinking when it got closer to us not wasting anybody's time, then I'd probably go out there and check okay. that out. Also. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to say, so in your vision, is that, will you have like a separate manager, maybe in a year or two, that is just running the school and leading that process? Okay. That's exactly what we've been talking about. We have one okay. person in particular who we think would be a great fit for it. Everything about him seems like it would be just a natural fit. Cool. Very cool. I like it. I'll be okay. excited to talk to you at the next expo. See where we're where we're at on that. Yeah, <laughs> Hopefully it's yeah. more than an idea, right? Hopefully there's progress. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Uh, good stuff. All right. Um I, so we've talked about a lot of stuff. I appreciate all your time, Trent. You're you're just you're awesome. Let me know if you gotta raise the the white flag and you gotta run. But uh, I wanted to talk about, you know, again, you were you were awesome. You sent some notes to me about things you wanted to talk about, you thought that would be beneficial and you had a list of things that you wanted to improve upon at Wirenut, which I thought was, I mean, I think it's cool that you're just so open. And I wanted to ask you about a few of those things. Um, okay. You said you want to raise your profit margin, which I'm sure is already pretty good. Your EBIT is probably pretty good, right? But you, I think you said you, your gross margin needs to improve. Um, is it is it a pricing issue or is it a just got to get your technicians more efficient? Or what do you perceive as the reason why your gross margin isn't quite where you want it to be? Well, this year has been a trickier one because you have to constantly do price. Um, oh yeah. Price increases. Yeah. Um, I've taken something, so I'm in a, or I was in a conversation with Leland and given him some credit on this for sure, some props on how he's helped me and he doesn't even know it. But <laughs> after a conversation where he stated that I'm not going to pay, uh, pay for a relationship, like that's an interesting way of looking at it. No. Because we are relational, we partner with our vendors, all of that kind of stuff. But if you're paying a premium for that, then he's right. Yeah. And so we started, I went to our, uh, we're carrying Ream, and I just caught word today because I've been kind of pretty harsh on them for a while here. And we've yeah. been shopping them against some others. I just caught wind that they're going in and giving us a, what sounds to be a pretty massive uh, price decrease. Cool. So in the times, how do you even have that happen? Well, this one was from sheer. Just transparency, like guys ain't working for us anymore. Do something about this, or we're leaving. And yeah. once we leave, we're not we're not playing this flip flop game. So once we leave, we're gone. Yeah. Um, 
And so that just simply, I don't think it's beating up. It's just giving them reality. Like this right. is what we need and either you can do it or maybe somebody else can. And so uh, where was I going? Oh, gross margin that directly, of course, your equipment pricing ties into it. Yep. Wages tied into it. We did a lot of cleanup on our, on our pay structures, like prior to where we're at now, which we still have a little bit left to clean up, but we had all these different pay types. And it oh, was okay. ridiculous, run and pay and there's a lot of people that are like that too. I mean, that's not an abnormal. It's, yeah. I think it's, it is the norm. Yeah. Yeah. So we go through and clean that up, standardize that. And in doing so, we had to make sure that we're doing our best to not lose anybody. Because again, sure. it's, for us, it's as much trust as we can keep. We are a for-profit business. We're not yeah. going to apologize for it. Just like you're not going to apologize for coming in and expecting a good wage. Right. Um, and so we did a lot of that. So between parts, equipment, and labor, that's really most of it. Other than that, it's production. And we've been working leaps and bounds on our production. So, you know, it's it's showing in our crown champs. Yeah. And then um, I, guess, I guess I would say the reason I'm saying that is we're a hybrid company. If we followed strictly the ESI model, we should be in our 60% gross margin. Yeah. If we followed an ASI model, we should be in our mid to low 50s. Right. We're a hybridized, so I think we should be right in the middle between 67 and 52. Yeah. But we're not. We're off by, I think it's like five points or so. So okay. we're like high 50s, somewhere around there, I believe, was what it came out at in, uh, in last year, all of last year. Yeah. So increasing that and everything else at the same time, though, we're very profitable. Thank God. It took a long time to get there. <laughs> um, I mean, it's been off and on, but we're the yeah. most profitable we've ever been. So it's not a thing of, oh, we got to fix it so much as we know we're not on the mark and what more can we do with it? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's an it up even better. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And so yeah. all of those things coming together, there's just been so many massive, oh, uh, purchasing. Sure. Tightening up our purchasing process, going to install crates or totes, you know, so the, so it takes a load off the seller. They don't have to yeah. prep the job as much. It takes a load off the installer. They don't have to have as much junk falling around in the truck. Yeah. And then we just have to bring those totes back in, uh, inventory them. That's what goes onto the job charge and give them a new tote in exchange. So it's a lot of work. Nice. Yeah. That's another role that's new. Josh uh, used to be our Home Depot or Barnett VMI guy, yeah. and he yeah. wanted to join our team, so we stole him. <laughs> they, they were okay with it. And okay, good. And, yeah, I, I might uh, have to cut this out because, you know, I, I get along with those guys and I don't need them yeah. getting mad at me. No, Ryan and all them, they're <laughs> well aware of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, so Josh is heading that up and he's on a lot of things he's had to tackle and learn and go on with that. And oh, sure. A new seat, you know, so yeah. a lot of, a lot of really, really cool things we've been working on this. That's cool. I'm intrigued by the comp structure because, my God, that is just perpetually a question that we get. So what what did you, you said you streamlined it. Is it, are you doing a commission or a piece rate or what, it, like, what are you doing across all three then? <clears throat> to answer that, um, when you get somebody that's not been in a commission structure or that's in install or the old school electrician, if I go to that trade, which is where I started, yeah. they always want to talk hourly. Right. You get, a, and that's out of fear. It's either they don't trust it or the wife at home doesn't trust it. And trust it. it's an unknown. And so why would we go and take this big risk for this company? We don't even know. Yeah. So um, with that though, they want to talk hourly. But if you just pay hourly, then where's the profit share? Where's the, hey, we won and now you win uh, right. model. So I think a lot of companies have gone into say a 30 or 25 or whatever hourly with a three or five or whatever percent commission on it. Mm -hmm. You can do that. But what are they really working for when you do that? They're working for hourly. Yeah. That's the majority of their pay. So how do you keep them in tune with caring about how they utilize their day and how they don't go to that customer's home multiple times and all that? Sure. So we've taken a pro an approach of it's either and or or. So it's either okay. hourly and commission or it's hourly or commission. We've taken the or approach. Okay. So in a nutshell, it's an hourly base, which um, is their fallback. If they're using that hourly fallback, then we consider it and they should consider it as a failure. You're allowed yeah. failure at times, but that should not be the norm. Right. So you're going to get your hourly or your commission. You can drop down, hit your hourly, and that's where I was saying that's a trigger for us. So every week when payrolls run, if there's anybody um, that costs us out of hourly, then we get how much, you know, or 
no, how much percentage and who it was. And yeah. so we're able to see, okay, wait, there's a re repetitious tone to this person. What, what's being done about it? Yeah. Um, the commission then is a two-part commission. And I only want to brush on this because there's so many different technologies and all that. In a nutshell, it's commission, it's a percentage for selling. And based on the person, this is where we get a little unique. Based on the person, they can either get a percentage for install or what I prefer because it speaks their language is a sold hour for install. Okay, yeah. Yep. So commission, so if you're a service tech, you're gonna get commission for selling the job and you're gonna get sold hour for installing the job. However many hours are allotted to it, whatever your sold hour rate is, which your sold hour rate is not the same as your fallback. Typically it's right. about 10 or so bucks higher. Yeah. Um, and that's how in a nutshell we've done it and it's working. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, did you have a big, I mean, you just had what a rollout meeting, like guys, this is what we're doing. Or how did you broach this topic of, Hey, we're going to mess with your mess is not a good word, but we're going to change how your pay, pay structure is. How, how did you do that? Uh, we started hiring some on the new structure. They didn't know any different. The yeah. problem then is if they start talking and comparing, but then we also shared with the others, hey, we're going to be switching over to this. So they had time yeah. to prepare. It wasn't a big surprise. Right. And then we would do that with some of them and uh, let them work it out and be okay. Yeah. The problem with that is if somebody is a naysayer on it, then they could also influence the others to not want to go that route. So sure. I don't have the magic answer on that. I just, what we did, you know, was, was that method. Yeah. That's yeah. a, that, if there's one that's tricky, it's that one. Well, right. It, yeah. And you said you built, you obviously trust is a big thing in the business and yeah. there's a lot of it. So they trusted you. So that's why you didn't have a, a you know, a bunch of people walking out. Um, right. Very good. All right. Just a couple more things. We, you answered a lot of the areas of improvement. You, you, you kind of veered into them. Uh, we talked about some materials and things, how you've tightened up there. Documenting processes. Obviously we talked about John, Jonathan, his, his role in, in working on that. Um, Leadership, you know, you said you need to grow leaders. Now, what? Obviously, Amanda is she's looking. I'm sure for leaders. You're looking for inter what? What is that? How else do you think you need to look for leaders? Like, what is that on your radar? How how are you addressing that? Is, is there anything else we haven't covered in that? Are you specifically? Are you referring to finding them, or are you thinking more along the lines of growing them? Either way, I mean, they're they're you got to have them, right? So you either get them internally, or you got to go fishing for them out in the sea. So. I mean, what what I mean, what what are some other things you're potentially doing? I guess for bringing value to the to the podcast, which is my intent here. Um, sure. If you're if you're thinking, okay, if if you know you're growing or you are growing, hopefully as a member and uh, you know in this or in, the, in this industry, um, you're going to need people to help you, and if any of us are thinking that that person is magically going to show up on our doorstep the day we need them, then that's, that's a pretty amazing uh, yeah. coincidence. <laughs> so instead you've got the option of go without them for a period of time and go through that pain or find them earlier. Always have your feeler out, always have your eyes you know, on the landscape looking. Yeah. And some of that goes with maybe networking locally. Some of it goes with what reputation are you creating in the community? Are you even noticed in the community? If you're not, then don't expect people to really come walking in saying, I'd like to join this. Yeah. Um, so that's what helps with growth. A lot of these things become easier and easier. Yeah. So that's what decision I had made. And that's one of those that I was trying to train into the team, you know, because otherwise they're in the day to day. They're probably that's not on their landscape. They're not thinking what leader do we need next? And when they come walking through the door, what do we do? So that's sure. one of those where you can adopt leaders that others trained. Yep. And then as far as growing them, that's where my mind has been going because of me getting more help on these initiatives. Right. I'm forcing myself into more of that stuff, which means I okay. need to do more mentorship, more right. intentional classes. Um, I had one of the techs ask me recently for financial advice and things like that. And I said, well, interesting. that's a good class to do. So yeah. What I'm thinking is I want to start doing some of those classes around that stuff. Not that I'm going to have all the answers, but I can at least get those resources in front of them and open the dialogue and be that that change maker for that. And like so it's that. A, it, growing leaders is honestly they just need to buy in, understand that it's worthy of their time, and you've got to give them the resources for them to grow and become better. Otherwise, they stagnate. And what do you expect from stagnated people? Right. I like that's, that you said. Pouring into people, you said earlier, you have to pour into people. You expect your manager to pour into your frontline people, right? And then 
yep. you're now realize you have to pour into into your managers to keep them growing to help them to find new ones. That's I, I like that a lot. That's good. Um, and that's where I'd spend too much of my time in the past. Tasks. Yep. That's not people. So yep. now maybe I can get out of the tasks. I can go into the people more and more. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, just kind of hopping around. You talked about a remote office earlier. I wanted to follow up. What What's the the attraction to remote office? I mean, I, just because limited overhead or or good question. You know, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued by that. The attraction to doing it, you're saying? Yeah. Because I, I can see, because I can see the law. Like, here's my concern: when people that that get when the the interactions, the personal interactions go away, I worry that a culture would go away. So, yeah. I mean, I, but I mean, unless you can figure, you, you've got a way to figure that out. I, I'm, that's why I, I'm asking. No, I don't. That's why we're still figuring, trying to figure it out. <laughs> um, the attraction would be if you've saturated what you're doing now. Okay. And um, I guess I skipped entirely over that. But a few years ago, I made the decision that I said, let's own Colorado Springs. Yep. Denver is our next near market. We've dabbled in Denver for years. We. Did I lose your audio? No, I no. got you. Sound a little different, but yeah. Oh, it switched. My earbud died. Ah, got it. If it still sounds fine, I'll just move on. No, you sound fine. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um. So uh, I decided, as long as this thing isn't glitching out. All right. I decided that uh, instead of stretching ourselves out and going to another market, then instead yeah. let's own the market we're in. And so we did just that. Sure. Yeah. So from that conscious effort, we've taken more market share. We're the largest brand in the city. Um, not braggy, I'm just saying that's no, no, an is, accomplishment that yeah. my team needs to be, you know, proud of. Um, sure. And we've put more in focus into culture, all these things that we can actually control physically and we can do more of. We bring in uh, breakfast food trucks, things like that. We can't, we can do that with a remote office, but it's harder and, you know, so on. So to answer your question, though, that was one of the dilemmas. What do we do with owning Colorado Springs now? Multiple yeah. trades, getting into drains after plumbing. There's other industries I've been watching, trying to figure out are they valid to do and and does the model fit? Okay. And then at some point, I'll still hit a saturation point. Sure. And so that's where by that time, I want to have that, that code cracked. Okay. Because, again, we're in... Last I checked, I think it's 600,000 people here. Right. So I can only do so much right, in the right. small market. No, that makes sense now. Okay. I thought it was just some attraction, to maybe just cutting out expense. All right. It, it, it's, it's a, you're worried about, you know, a limitation in terms because of the, because of the city size. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah, perhaps that was good. Limitation. Also, you do have the scale benefit. You know, if you can reproduce everything else you have, then you don't have to pop in a new finance center, new call center, new, you yeah. know. Right. Right. No, that makes sense. That makes because my net my literally my next question was going to be, how do you continue to grab market share in a town the size of Colorado Springs, other than hopefully people keep moving there? You know, I mean, so I mean, I, I do you feel, pretty much feel like you've you've maxed out what you can in terms of marketing. I don't even have an answer anymore on that. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so because I thought so before. I remember ten years ago we thought we maxed out electrical. Yeah, and then later I thought, well, maybe we maxed out the rest. I don't think we have. We're okay. doing new things that are risky, but they're worth it. And I, I love a good, you know, curiosity answer anyway. Sure. So we're doing other things that are working. Um, we're going out and touting ourselves in different ways that we never did. Like when we had done charitable acts in the past, I was just like, we're just doing them. Now Warren talked me into, you know, putting uh, advertising behind them. Right. So every month we're, uh, I go on TV and I give out this big old check to the nonprofit that the viewership of that station voted for. That's cool. And it ties us to good acts. It shows people who we are. It gets us that exposure, which yeah. means now, since I've internalized this, it means now we can do more and more of it. And yeah. so it works. It you know, yeah. So that's something we had never done. And if I would have never done it before, or if I would have never done it at all, we would have never had the answer on how much more market share. Right, right. I know that's a struggle for a lot. I mean, we, there's a lot of really good, I mean, good people I know in this organization. They have good biz, businesses and they donate a ton and and they hate, they, that's a struggle, right? You, you're not doing it for the publicity. You're doing it because you've been blessed and you want to in turn help the community that's helped you. But, you yeah. know, at the same time, you're right. It does allow you then to continue to hopefully help more and more people, you know, if you continue to grow as well. So 
Yep. I, I, I appreciate that. Thing, I want to give this value for anybody that cares to hear it also. So we did, we've done all these awards. Those are, you know, are we doing it because we want to be the kid with all these trophies on the wall or are we doing it because it means something more? Yeah. And on the mean something more piece of it, it allows our team to get behind us and realize who we are. And if there's anybody out in the parking lot bitching about this or that or saying how much better it is over there or whatever, they've yeah. got to at least pause or at least they have something to rebuttal that saying, well, we're not totally jackasses, right? <laughs> and, and we got it past that phase to the phase now where this is this is so humbling and just so cool to see. Yeah. There's a, um, the EICS award, Excellence in Customer Service Award, is one that yeah. we are the owner of. We have seven yeah. of them. The next closest company has five. Wow. And these aren't something where only one company can win. You're measured against Malcolm Baldridge standards, which, you know, it's a whole arduous thing. Yeah. We have seven of them now. And in the last award ceremony, uh, this guy that runs this large car dealership that has won four of them or something like that, and they do a yeah. good job, and they're very well known in the community. Um, he was telling John over a conversation at the award ceremony, he was telling John, he said, we're coming for you guys. <laughs> he was like, that's awesome. Yeah. So we're all, not only do we have a challenge ahead of us, and it gets harder every year that we win it. We have to keep notching up. Otherwise, they can't give us the award for just being the right. same as we were. Right. And then we've got the acknowledgement of these other companies. And here, think about this as a business owner for a minute. If these other companies notice you, they have a team of people that also notice you. When you need right. your next leader, how do you know it won't be the marketing guy from a car dealership? How do you know it won't be a good salesperson, not an empty one, from yeah. the car dealership? How do you know it won't be, what are some other ones? There's a medical um, company that helps elderly. There's all these things. If you're on the radar, then you get opportunity. It's a good point. That's a very good point. I like that. So, so when you aspire to to continue to to hit those those types of awards, is that part of your quarterly meetings? Like, oh, hey guys, we want to do this. What do we need to do next? Well, how do we, you know, how do we push that standard even higher? I don't think you can. You can barely see it. It's over there, just above that black table. But that's our one year and three year picture. It's uh -huh. our um, core values. Um, our market strategy, so our, our three uniques, those kinds of things. That's all, by the way, a result of EOS. If somebody wants like help out of the box, go look up an EOS, local EOS coach, facilitator. Yeah. You can do it on your own also. Read the book, Traction. But right. I think you're going to have a much slower output. Right. I was going to say, I think I have a traction. Here. So we put that on our on our radar. Yep. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, Gino Wickman, right? Yep. Gino Wickman. Yep. So, so it yeah. just it keeps us focused and it gets us there. And so to, to wrap back around, those awards are helpful in us growing our team, helpful in validating our team, helpful in them believing in themselves. You know, you, you have to have some kind of something to validate who you are other than you just bragging about yourself. You know, oh, in a way. it makes sure. it easier at least. Sure. Good stuff. All right. Uh, hour and a half. Thank you, Trent. This was awesome. I really enjoyed this. I always enjoy talking to you. <laughs> contract we always have a good time uh well just wrapping up the uh, five years from now ten years from now do you have a grand scheme idea of what this is all going to look like i mean you you obviously you mentioned and i know you you know you've been approached to, to to sell your business and you cash out and have a good time but you want something more obviously i think so what is that what does the more look like my big thing is the freedom that i want mm -hmm. and that to me just is so I want to have a bunch of properties that I'd be RBO out otherwise. And okay. I go to them when I feel like it and they're in places that I desire. And yeah. I'm already working on pieces of that. So anyway, that would give me some of the freedom to where I'm doing something different or unique in my day. I don't like monotony. Yeah. So it gives me that freedom. Um, I already have some of the freedom. I don't come in in most mornings. That's because I spend that time thinking and working out and whatever. And I found if I try to do that in the afternoon, it just doesn't happen as much. Or I'm yep. home really, really late. So yeah. I've got that freedom. The strain or whatever that comes with that is that I don't see my field team as much. Right. They seem to be perfectly fine with it. Yeah. Monthlies and quarterlies are enough for them. So I think it's just me. I just need to get over it. And I've been working <laughs> on it. Um, if I have those things, I don't need to go anywhere. Yeah. yeah. I'm happy. I like if it's profitable as it has been, I don't need to go anywhere. If it's got cool. good people, not a bunch of drama and chaos, I don't need to go anywhere. So all these things are also built for a self-serving reason. I don't yeah. want all that crap. Yeah. 
It's, I like it. That sucks. And so long term though, I've got my oldest son. He's uh, he graduated from college in marketing. You've met him, Gavin. Yep. He's here. One of my goals, I declined an offer from somebody that we both know, and I said one of the reasons is I want to mentor him. And uh, my dad taught me the trades. I'm teaching him business, so that's part yep. of the goal also. If he oh, wants to take it over, which that's the talk now, then great. Um, he's gonna have to earn it. He's gonna have to work sure. for it. Sure. Um, if it's sold later or ESOP, I wouldn't necessarily do a structured ESOP, but something like that where it's a team of you know of all of us, I'm cool with that. I yeah. see it as being a family of this business, other businesses, opportunities, all those kinds of things, all kind of interacting together and continuing to make a big impact. And I don't see any end in sight personally. That's awesome. That's great. Okay, I got to ask the last question. VR, your VRBO properties. Where are we looking at? Because I I need some vacation spots. Where do we like that I don't know about? I'm ADD all over on that one. <laughs> uh, what is it? Where do we spend New Year's? Uh, Bolivar Peninsula in Texas. Oh, okay. You're on the beach with a campfire and fireworks. You can't do fireworks in Colorado. Oh, you really? Fires, uh -huh. you don't go near. So, and I'm I in Missouri, from, so we were, okay, we're okay with those, yeah. And I come from <laughs> Kansas where you could do them all the oh. time. So I miss fireworks. So yeah. uh, we looked at that. I looked at Destin, Florida, Sarasota. Oh, yeah. I've been inclined towards Sarasota since going back there from SGI. Sure. Um, mountain properties here because those will be really great for team. You know, hey, you did this, head on up to it. Or, hey, let's have a gathering. Let's go do this. Yeah. Um, I want them all to be bigger. So all of them that I've been looking at are pretty big, uh, yeah. partially for family gatherings, reunions, That's whatever. Um, what are some others? I love going to Mexico because I love the rawness of that country. It feels like yeah. 1980s America where you, if you were stupid, you just get hurt and that's your decision. <laughs> uh, yeah. And that's not allowed here anymore. So anyway, right. but I don't know that I want to own a lot of property there because it's got a lot of other encumbrances. So sure. just. I like it. Of them, you know. That's cool. Well, oh, good for you. That's uh, Lake of those arcs. I love Lake of those arcs. Yeah. Oh man. That place is so different from, uh, when I grew up going there, you know, 30 years ago, it's it's yeah. uh, it's like Vegas on the water now a lot, yeah. in a lot of ways. But it's we've had some great family uh, vacations there. It's just a lot of yeah. fun. It's got everything. You certainly you can do the family stuff. You certainly can do the uh, yeah. out and about bachelor party stuff. But it's a yeah. good time. Not so much Branson though. That's like old it's, and gambling. It's getting better. We do a lot of holiday stuff down there because they got stuff for kids. But yeah, it's better than what it once was. It's not the place where the old country singers go to die now. It's yeah. a little better, but anyway. Yep. All right, Trent. Well, thank you for your over hour and a half of time. Uh, actually, two hours because you and I would just be asked for 30 minutes before I hit record. So I really, really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in person soon. Yeah, you too. So are you actually going to air this whole thing? People yeah. Oh, yeah. This. 90 minutes. You, yeah. I mean, it wasn't like it was junk that you just uh, you, you were spewing. It was good stuff. If people want to well, listen to it all, they, they, they're welcome to it. thank you. And sorry for the length of it. Oh, that's great. They'll get through it. They'll, they'll get, you know, the, the beauty of podcast, you listen at two times speed, you know, so yes. we can, we'll I like always do that. I'll do yeah. the 1.2 because you can't really 1. tell the big difference. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Two, like two is a little stretch, but yeah. yeah. 1.2. 1. 1.2 is just a newer thing, too. I feel like it was 1.5. I think yeah. that was a newer update. So there you go. Depends on so, the app, yeah. probably. Right. So Trent's telling you to listen to him at 1.2 speed. He's okay with that. So we should have said this in the beginning. <laughs> I'll cut this part and put it to the front. <laughs> okay. Good. Perfect. Even <laughs> Don't better. Don't worry. When they see 90 something minutes, they're going to do that already. So hey, before you get to listening, by the way, do this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's funny. Okay. All right, Trent. Have a good right. rest of your day, buddy. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> That's Trent Urban of Wirenut Home Services in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Thanks for joining us. If you feel like you have a great story worth sharing that would also help other contractors, email me at bhouchen at yoursgi.com. Also, if you enjoyed today's episode, if you're on YouTube, give us a like and subscribe. If you're on your favorite podcast player, leave us a five-star review. And please join us for future episodes. It's my promise to you that we'll continue to interview successful contractors and other influential individuals in residential contracting. This has been The Successful Contractor, powered by Success Group International. Support for this podcast comes from A.O. Smith. Sold exclusively by plumbing wholesalers and plumbing contractors, A.O. Smith's selection of residential and commercial water heaters, boilers, and storage tanks is unmatched for quality and diversity. Its families and brands include State, American, and Takagi. 
Anywhere hot water is needed, A.O. Smith can provide an energy-efficient solution with maximum value during and for years after installation. And A.O. Smith stands behind its products and its customers with world-class service, combining cutting-edge technology with committed people who take pride in being the very best. As the leading manufacturer of water heaters, A.O. Smith is committed to helping contractors succeed. Visit www.hotwater.com contractor to see why becoming an A.O. Smith contractor can help you find new ways to connect with both your customers and potential customers and take your business to the next level. The Successful Contractor Podcast is part of the Success Group International family. SGI is the largest member-owned best practices organization for independent residential services contractors. SGI provides its members a competitive edge through proven proprietary management tools and expertise, marketing programs, training, and group buying power, along with a highly active and eager to help membership. For more information about Success Group International, visit www.yoursgi.com.